Well, yesterday uh, we talked about uh, the really the interaction of God with mankind in bringing us into salvation. And as a consequence of that, we are responding to what Paul identified as both being chosen by God, according to what he foreknew about us before he ever chose us, before we ever became a being in our mother's womb, and that he began to sanctify us by his Holy Spirit. And I think that process begins long before we ever get saved. Because I remember after I got saved, I began to reflect back on my life previously, and there were these little paragraphs copes of experience in my life that I could look at and say, you know, those were little things that kind of pushed me in the direction of God. It made him so real to me. And, and it's interesting that uh, even though I was not a believer before I got saved, in fact, I felt like Christianity had nothing to offer me whatsoever. And I was looking in all sorts of other places for answers. The reality was, how did I come to the conclusion that I needed an answer? And the answer, the answer to that question is, it's by the searching that we're engaged in. We're looking at something. G.K. Chesterton said that even when a man knocks on the door of a brothel, you know, a house of prostitution, he's looking for God. In other words, he's feeling this void in himself that he's trying to feel, fill in all the wrong ways. But that void is the one that really drives us to seek after God. And so we find that God knows us about us. He really kind of sets up the game so we'll have every opportunity to begin searching for him. And he's even patient and tolerant with us when we search in the wrong ways, in the wrong places, for the wrong things. Because it's the disappointment that we began to experience. And certainly that was my case before I got saved. I had uh, lived pretty fast and hard and done a lot of things by the time I was 19 years of age. And I was pretty disillusioned with just about everything. I mean, I felt like even in situations where other people say, well, you've succeeded here and you've won there, I still felt such a deep sense of unfulfillment. I remember, I mean, very seriously, the question in my mind was, what is my purpose for existing? I mean, if I'm a just evolved accident and I'm just going to live out my time and then die and be gone and be forgotten of in five years, ten years, certainly by a hundred years, nobody will know who I was or care. And you find people who are viciously trying to uh, establish some kind of long-term legacy, which frankly most of us don't give a rip about. You know, the, when I look at that futility of life, it was this thing that made me start thinking about suicide. I mean, I never really contemplated taking my life, but what was scaring me was I was losing the argument of why I shouldn't. And as I began to face that, there became this searching in my heart saying, there's got to be more to this than that. And Eastern mysticism wasn't getting me there. And so that's when I was first presented with the gospel. And that presentation was so impactful, not because it was done well. In fact, quite honestly, it was done pretty poorly. But it was so impactful that, that it, it, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit that I knew I was a sinner and I needed God. And believe me, I before had argued often that I was not a sinner, that I was a good person. And if there was anybody who deserved to go to heaven, it was me. I was pretty blind to my sins. And I remember that moment, I just felt so convicted. Even though the gentleman who was talking to me lost the argument, uh, he won the point. <laughs> he won the day. And uh, he went away angry. I think he wanted to strangle me because I was so rude and so irritating and how I bicker with people. But the whole point was that after he was gone and I was left with myself, I knew that I was in sin. I knew that I didn't know God. I knew that I was lost. And that became the crack in the door that began to let the light of the gospel begin to flood into my life. And it ultimately took about 12 hours before I finally bent the knees and asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. But for what purpose did he call me and save me? And this is what I think is missing a lot of times in our gospel presentations. Because he, again, he says, for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? By his sprinkling of his blood. Well, first of all, what am I called to? I'm called to be his servant. More literally, I'm called to be Christ's slave. And one of the things about slaves is that they're, they're judged by their obedience, not by their ability. 
And many of us think that we have some fanciful ability and therefore we should be able to exercise that ability as we see fit. But that's because we don't live in a culture that truly honestly isn't that familiar with the day-to-day -day reality of being a slave. A slave doesn't set his pay. A slave doesn't set his working conditions. A slave doesn't set his hours. In other words, all of those things that control his life have been given to another, and he is just simply called to be obedient to do exactly what he or she has been told to do. And so he said, when you came to Christ, you were sanctified, you were separated from this world and estranged from this world so that you would be cut, come to a place of obedience to Christ. And I'm kind of, you know, it's kind of sad because it seems like so many people don't understand that it's not an option to obey God. They, they somehow had this idea, well, you know, if I don't like it, I don't agree with it, then I can have my own opinion and my own point of view. And it becomes clear the way they handle Scripture. They look at Scripture and say, yeah, I don't agree with that. Well, let me tell you this, honestly, there's a lot of things in the Bible I read that I don't agree with. I mean, when it talks about forgiving your enemies, loving your enemies, and praying for those who despitefully use you, listen, me, I don't agree with that, but I know that's God's will for my life, and I have to prayerfully ask God, bring my heart into agreement, bring my mind into agreement with your will. There are times when I do things simply out of obedience, and then the feeling of joy and reward comes afterwards. But I quite honestly, in the very beginning, I'm just saying, okay, Lord, your will be done. I've traveled all sorts of places around the world, uh, living and facing in all sorts of uncomfortable situations and done it over and over and over again because I knew it was what God was calling me to do. It was an act of obedience. I remember talking to a, a non-Christian gentleman one time and, and he was wondering, why do you go to India if it's so hard and so difficult and so many hardships uh, and you don't really enjoy it? And I told him, I said, because I have to be obedient to God. And once I obey him, I always rejoice in obeying him. That when I'm ministering, I'm teaching, I'm doing what I'm doing, it's such a joy and a fulfillment. It makes all the other stuff just kind of become unimportant. Because in the end of the day, I, I, I've been obedient to God and he has blessed me for my obedience. Although I admit when I get in the plane and start heading home, I'm really happy to be on the way home uh, and to be able to eat food I'm familiar with and sleep in a bed that I know and all the rest of that stuff. But you see, that's something that I think is often lost, that many Christians don't see that obedience to the Lord is, is critical to the joy of the Lord. And that's why when he talks about the sprinkling by his blood, what that sprinkling was is a cleansing. They sprinkled these articles of service in the temple. They sprinkled the priest. They sprinkled their garments. What was that all about? Purifying them so they could be used to serve God. So what Christ has done is he's, when you're obedient to him, you become purified for the ministry that he calls him to. So for me, you know, being I'm a pastor was not something I ever aspired to as a career goal or an ambition. In fact, I, I have to admit that for the first 10 years I was in pastoral ministry, I was uncomfortable being referred to as a pastor because I never saw myself as being a pastor. I remember I was in Colorado one time and went to draw some money out of a bank because I was out of cash back in the days when credit cards weren't that usable. And uh, the teller looked at me and said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor, because I was a guy, stranger from out of town, right, in this little city. And she said, you don't look like a pastor. <laughs> I said, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, because that's the whole point. We have this in our mind, this idea that people who become pastors are people who came out of their mother's womb, quoting John 3, 16, and holding up a Bible and saying, listen to the Word of God. No. We are people who are like every other people. We deal with the same problems as every other people have. But the difference is, is that we recognize that we're to do what we're called to do by God and to do it obediently as best we can. And if we do, He will qualify us for whatever He's called us to do. So, you know, I often realize that when God was choosing people to serve Him, He didn't pick me because I was the sharpest knife in the drawer. I mean, I'm not the brightest bulb in the package. And yet God, for whatever reasons, chose me because it pleased him. And that's all I can say in retrospect. It pleased him to do stuff. He qualified me. And see, when we do that, that's where the rest of this introduction of this letter comes. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. 
that when you're obedient to God, you receive His grace, which is not only His blessing, His favor, but it's His enablings, His, your, His ability to do what you need to do. And he says, I'll give you peace. There'll be a tranquility where you'll find yourself stepping into situations that you know are way above your pay grade. And yet somehow you're at peace with that and you just trust God to use you as he will. And he says, not only will he do that, give you grace and peace, but to do it in abundance. And it's interesting because the word abundance here is really meant in the context of progressively. It becomes more abundant, more abundant, and more abundant. It multiplies itself in your life. That the more that we yield to God, the more that God will trust us with, and the more he will work through us. And that's the whole goal. Because as long as we can maintain that Christian spiritual discipline of not touching the glory and humbling ourselves before God and just being obedient to what he's called us to do and never taking credit upon ourselves for what good things God does in and through us, that God will trust us with ever more stuff and we'll know that it's him because as Paul would say, I am what I am by the grace of God. Well, I hope this has been a helpful week as we've begun to break open the seal of this book and we'll continue looking on as we uh, get into it next week again. So God bless you, go in his grace and thank you for taking the time to follow this. In Jesus' name, amen.